911. How can I help you? Uh, I think I found a body along the road. It looks like a female. I can see a hand with fingernail polish. She says, I know he did it because I was there. What do you look like? Tall, built, brown hair. He's about six foot six, good 300 pounds. He'd tell anybody who'd listen, I'm the happy faced killer. The shadowy figure looms over the wall, scribbling a message. The flickering lights of the truck stop bathroom make it difficult to see. Determination is the drive, to let everyone know the truth. How dare someone else take credit for their work? They sign the confession with a smiley face. January 24th, 1990, a young college student was riding his bike along the Columbia River Gorge when he spotted something. He got off his bike to inspect. To his horror, it was a woman with her clothes pulled apart in a compromising position. She was dead. Nauseous and overwhelmed, he sped off to notify the police. Investigators thought that she was just a Jane Doe but later were contacted by her parents who identified the body as 23-year-old Tanya Bennett. Tanya was a mentally disabled woman who was very trusting of others, the perfect target for bullies. But her parents would never imagine she would be a victim of brutality. The night prior to her being found, Tanya had entered the B&I Tavern in Portland, Oregon. She was a regular there, often opting to switch between two types of drinks. After becoming tipsy, she began playing pool with a couple of unknown men. Witnesses said she disappeared shortly after, never to be seen again. On February 5th, the Multnomah County Police Department received a phone call from an anonymous source, claiming to have overheard a man bragging about murdering Tanya. This man was John Sosnovsky and the anonymous caller was determined by his parole officer to be his longtime girlfriend, Laverne Pavlinak. Laverne, 58, was well known by police to file false police reports on John, so law enforcement was reluctant to believe her at first. John was an alcoholic and known to get physically abused at times. The police suspected that this was just another one of her ploys to get out of this undesirable relationship. According to her account, on January 21st, she received a phone call from John, claiming that he was in trouble and she needed to meet him right away in Troutdale. She drove up to a truck stop to find John hiding between two trailers. On the ground was the body of Tanya, wrapped in a blanket at his feet. Is she sick? She's dead. Laverne certainly felt sick, but she was there to help. The two rolled the body in a shower curtain and disposed of it along the old Columbia River Highway. As a souvenir, John cut a piece of Tanya's jeans. Following the tip, a raid on the Sosnovsky Pavlinak residence, police found an envelope addressed to John that said, T. Bennett, a good piece. Police gave Laverne a wire to attempt to have John implicate himself, but it was unhelpful. Also, during questioning, it didn't seem like Laverne could keep the story straight. After a forensic investigation was completed on her vehicle, there was no evidence found of a body having been in there, and the shower curtain couldn't be located. Her next interview changed drastically. Laverne claimed that Tanya was still alive when she got to the truck stop and willingly got into the car. They were to give her a ride to her mother's house in Portland, but John had other plans. John knocked out Tanya and forced Laverne to drive to Crown Point, where they entered the Vista House, a historical building converted into a rest stop. Laverne was then coerced to assist in holding Tanya down with a rope as she was assaulted by John. It wasn't long before she eventually suffocated to death. Still suspicious, the police had Laverne guide them on how to get to the location of the body. 
They were proved wrong when Laverne brought them to the exact spot where Tanya was found. Both Laverne and John were promptly arrested. Laverne changed her story yet again in her trial on January 24th, when she told the police she initially lied to them in an attempt to escape her abusive boyfriend, but the damage was already done. She was charged with being an accomplice to second-degree murder and sentenced to a maximum of 10 years, while John was sentenced for life. To avoid the death penalty, John pleaded guilty. Just when the police thought they cracked the case, graffiti was found in a truck stop bathroom in Livingston, Montana, signed with a smiley face. Another piece of graffiti was found on the walls of a bathroom in Umatilla, Oregon. Detectives thought that these notes couldn't possibly be true, that they'd already caught the culprits, and decided that it must have been a friend of John's who was trying to get him out of jail. The notes were ignored. All was calm for four long years, until 1994, when newspapers began receiving letters attesting to several murders of women across the country, all with the same handwriting, all with a crudely drawn smiley face. The Portland, Oregonian newspaper received a confession. I feel bad, but I will not turn myself in. I'm not stupid. In a lot of opinions, I should be and I feel I deserve it. My responsibility is mine, and God will be my judge when I die. I am telling you this because I will be responsible for these crimes and no one else. It all started when I wondered what it would look like to kill someone. And I found out. <laughs> what a nightmare it has been. Look over your shoulder. I'm closer than you think. The Colombian newspaper in Vancouver, Washington received a similar letter that the police would use to compare handwriting and other crimes. Meanwhile, dead bodies were showing up all around the country in the same compromising position. On March 10, 1995, a man with a clean criminal record, Keith Hunter Jesperson, was a suspect in the murder of his girlfriend, Julie Ann Winningham. Clark County, Washington Sheriff's Department, Detective Rick Buckner, investigated the Cheney Trucking Company he worked for. His travel itinerary was provided, and he was tracked down in Las Cruces, New Mexico on March 22nd. He refused to speak without an attorney, so he was released. On March 24th, he attempted suit twice before writing a letter confessing to his crimes. Afterwards, he called Detective Buckner and confessed on the phone as well. Keith was an unassuming divorced father of three with no criminal record who made his living as a truck driver. He originally wanted to be an RCMP officer, but his dreams were shattered when he was injured during training. He was described as a caring man, but was prone to anger, even allegedly hurting neighborhood animals, according to his daughter. His wife filed for divorce as he was suspected of being unfaithful while on his drives, and his wife deemed him unstable and had moved herself and the kids away for their own safety. According to his family, he was born in British Columbia to a family of six, but was treated differently than his siblings. He would be abused by his alcoholic father and charged room and board as if he were a nuisance. As a child, he would act out and set fires to other animals and threaten to kill his friends. Keith's attorney, Thomas Fellon sat him down as he confessed to the murder of Julie Ann Willingham. Eventually, Keith confessed to the murder of Tanya, as well as the other woman. He was the happy face killer, or face, as he preferred. The following is Keith's story on the night of January 21st, 1990. Tanya had gone to the tavern that night and was playing pool with a couple of men, one of whom was Keith Jesperson. They were both having a couple of drinks together before he offered to buy Tanya dinner. She easily accepted, but upon checking, he noticed he was out of money. Keith offered to drive her to his house to pick up the cash. 
she agreed and hopped into his car. On the way to his house, he tried to coerce her into having sex and eventually raped her after a verbal argument got violent. Keith then quickly drove back to the tavern to plant his alibi. He had a couple of drinks with the patrons to make himself known before hopping back into his car to drop off the body close to Columbia River Gorge. One alibi wasn't enough. He needed something else. Keith drove off to a rest stop near Troutdale and drank coffee for the rest of the night. The next morning, he drove to Sandy River Highway and flung the contents of Tanya's purse into a bushy area. Detectives didn't believe him initially, as they had convicted the killer years ago, suspecting he was trying to take the blame for a friend, and brought Keith and Laverne in for a lie detector test. Weirdly enough, Keith passed, but lie detectors weren't always accurate. They drove him to the area to have him show where he dumped the body, but he wasn't able to properly point the location out. The police decided he was lying until Keith mentioned that he threw Tanya's purse nearby. Days later, an officer came by with Tanya's ID. Keith was declared the killer. On November 27, 1995, after four years in prison for a crime they didn't commit, Laverne and John were let out. Keith, on the other hand, received a life sentence initially for the murder of Julie Ann Winningham and another life sentence was tacked on for the death of Tanya Bennett. Keith never made it easy for the court, however. Over the years, he kept retracting and adding to his statements, likely to throw off prosecutors, one of which was for the murder of Bobby Crescenzi. But police learned from tracking Keith's movements that he was being fed information from her husband, Jack Crescenzi, who was being held in the same prison. Jack had promised to pay Keith's children $10,000 if he was released. In all, Keith admitted to 160 murders that he was unable to prove. In 1997, he was back and forth in his confession to the murder of Angela Subris. Keith finally admitted after Laramie County prosecutors offered a plea deal that would prevent him from receiving the death penalty if he confessed to her murder. Keith Hunter Jesperson claimed that he was no monster, a sentiment he can continue to reflect on over three consecutive life sentences in the Oregon State Penitentiary, where there are no happy faces.